ago. And um, there were actually some people who said, you know, we shouldn't get a new organ. They're too expensive and they're out of date. Uh, but over the years, you know, I've come to really appreciate the organ. And uh, it is a really beautiful instrument that uh, is kind of a, a unique relationship with the church, isn't it? That, that one instrument is uh, a kind of tied to our tradition in the church like no other instrument. And uh, so, and Greg, the way Greg just played that piece, it was really, really nice to hear. Um, welcome to the Sunday before Thanksgiving. A Thanksgiving which is going to be a little different than the normal Thanksgivings. But, uh, you know, the, the good thing I'm hearing about vaccines uh, tells me that um, I think these masks are, are going to be temporary, right? <laughs> uh, we just have to wait it out a few more months and things are looking good and you know I, I am just impressed I heard that a typical vaccine takes eight years to develop so it, it, it's really remarkable we have some incredible people researching and developing these things and we're very fortunate to, to have that uh, ability. And uh, I think I've heard as many as four companies now have a vaccine. I think Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca just came out with some news. Uh, so that is really good to hear. And uh, it makes it a little easier to, to go through this really bad time of spreading the virus, knowing that you know, we, have, we have hope in the near future uh, of a vaccine getting out there to everybody and helping us. Um, but uh, yeah, we need to continue to pray for our situation. And uh, uh, it, it is going to be a tough couple of months coming up. A um, few announcements, just to remind you, uh, the Women's Bible Study is meeting Mondays at 11 a.m. in the lounge. And what are we studying right now? Encountering Jesus, okay, Mondays at 11 a.m. Uh, senior Bible study is not going to meet this Wednesday, uh, but will resume December 2nd. And I believe they're studying the Gospel of Matthew. Is that right, Pastor Lynn? Yes. Okay. Uh, there is a flower chart that is up, and you can call in if you want to put your name on the flower chart. There's also a poinsettia form. Uh, that we're asking you to consider filling out for poinsettias for Christmas. Uh, we have special music planned for the Sundays in Advent. Uh, Greg has lined up uh, a string trio, I believe it is, uh, for the Sundays in Advent. And for those of you uh, viewing uh, online, we have about 20 people here today, so we have space for more people. If you would like to join and feel safe, welcome to come out. We still have space available. Um, I want to thank those of you who donated turkeys. I think we had 10 turkeys collected. And thanks, Dean Martin, for uh, getting them over to uh, the Bread of Life in Palmyra. And um, Wednesday evening, we are continuing our study, a Zoom meeting at 7 p.m. on the Universal Christ. I'll talk a little bit more about that in my sermon. So there's some other announcements in there in the bulletin, and you can look over them. And I'm having trouble with my glasses and my mask this morning. I'm trying to keep my glasses below the mask so I can see that they fold up. Um, but I'm having trouble with that. Uh, so as we have been doing, you know, our prayers do impact reality. Our thoughts and emotions do impact our relationships and our world. And especially during this time, it's so important for us not to be consumed with anxiety and fear and having negative thoughts about what if something goes wrong. These are not helping us. So we need to learn how to change those negative thoughts and emotions that keep coming up 
and turn them into a prayer for healing and wholeness and for God's mercy. Uh, this not only helps our own spiritual state when we learn how to do this, but those prayers for healing do make a difference in our world. Actually, we will we'll find out how that works. Um, I believe at the time of death, we have a life for you where we see how everything we thought and did and said impacted those around us in the world. We actually get a chance to experience that and learn how that impacted others. Um, so it does. So our prayers make a difference. So I felt it so important for us at the beginning of worship to pause for a moment of silent prayer for the healing of the world and in solidarity with all people as we find in our text for this morning's reading. Um, we join together with those who are suffering, those who are grieving, and those who have lost their life. And we can help them now as we pray for them. So let's spend a moment in silent prayer thinking of our health care workers, families who've lost loved ones, and for those who have died. Let's pray for them now. Gracious God, pour out your spirit upon us. That even during the crisis of this pandemic, we may truly give you thanks and praise that we may understand that everything will be fine in your kingdom. And that your kingdom will come to this earth. And that you will help us understand the mysteries of life and death. That we will one day realize that your love will conquer all. And that one day there will be no more tears, no more loss, no more death. And that we will live together in the joy of your salvation. Here he lays on. Lord, have mercy on us. Amen. All right, one thing I did forget to, to mention. Uh, the deacons are collecting for Angel Tree again this year, and uh, it is going to go to the Catholic Charities Emergency Services of Burlington. So please place your unwrapped gift uh, under the tree, and the gifts need to be in early this year, December 8th, Tuesday, December 8th. Uh, so just keep that in mind, and thank you so much for participating in the Angel Tree Ministry, and thank the deacons for organizing this.
The scripture for this morning is uh, following the lectionary readings, Matthew 25, 31 to 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left and the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in? Or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison or go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, from time to time, I like to uh, follow prayers of the church as they have been written in the past. This comes from the 1929 Book of Common Prayer. So imagine life in the United States in 1929 and uh, listen to the words and the language of this prayer for the church. Let's pray together. Good Christian people, I bid your prayers for Christ's holy Catholic Church. The blessed company of all faithful people, that it may please God to confirm and strengthen it in purity of faith, in holiness of life, and in perfectness of love, and to restore to it the witness of visible unity and more especially for that branch of the same planted by God in this land, whereof we are members, that in all things it may work according to God's will, serve God faithfully, and worship him acceptably. Ye shall pray for the President of these United States, and for the Governor of this state, and for all that are in authority, that all and every one of them may serve truly in their several callings to the glory of God and the edifying and well-governing of the people, remembering the account they shall be called upon to give at the last great day. Ye shall also pray for the ministers of God's holy word and sacraments, that they may minister faithfully and wisely the discipline of Christ and ye shall pray for a due supply of persons fitted to serve God in the ministry 
and to that end as well as for the good education of all the youth of this land. You shall pray for all schools, colleges, and seminaries, for all whose hands are open for their maintenance, that whatsoever tends to the advancement of true religion and useful learning may forever flourish and abound. Ye shall pray for all the people of these United States, that they may live in true faith and fear of God, and in brotherly charity one towards another. Ye shall pray also for all who travel by land, sea, or air, for all prisoners and captives, for all who are in sickness or in sorrow, for all who have fallen into grievous sin, Ye shall also praise God for rain and sunshine, for the fruits of the earth, for the products of all honest industry, and for all his good gifts, temporal and spiritual, to us and to all men. And finally, ye shall yield unto God most high praise and hearty thanks for the wonderful grace and virtue declared in all his saints who have been the choice vessels of his grace and the lights of the world in their several generations. And pray unto God that we may have grace to direct our lives after their good examples, that this life ended we may be partakers with them of the glorious resurrection and life everlasting. We pray all these things in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
him. That was nice. And uh, that was Diana and Greg. Uh, and thanks so much. I think, is it safe to clap? Is, is that a safe to clap? Is that safe to clap? <laughs> I want to thank Diana and Greg have just been fantastic during this uh, pandemic and when we had closed down way back in March. And uh, they have done a fantastic job and they have worked together. Diane, it's so nice of you to come over here this morning to play that piece for us. And I, they're both such wonderful people and we're really fortunate to have them serving in our churches and providing the ministry of music to us. So thank you so much uh, for that. And I did love that arrangement of In the Garden. All right, we are uh, preparing for a Thanksgiving. And uh, I know that a lot of people are upset, especially those of you who love having your family over. Uh, there is uh, something unique and special about the celebration of, of Thanksgiving uh, as uh, uh, a time for us to give thanks to God. And, uh, and pause and reflect on the blessings of God. And did you notice in, in the old 1920 Book of Common Prayer that we are to remember to pray and give thanks for the rain and the sunshine? I don't know about you, but when, when I wake up to a rainy day, my tendency is to complain and moan. But uh, the church I grew up in, Sandy Hill Mennonite Church in Coatesville, Pennsylvania, had a number of farmers who were in the congregation. And uh, one of the small groups that I was in included a farmer. And uh, when we prayed weekly together, we gathered in the small group, he always thanked God for the rain and the sunshine. And uh, even things as simple as the rain and the sunshine we tend to take for granted, don't we? Uh, and not fully appreciate the incredible earth and the way that it grows food to nourish our bodies. An amazing way that God has made creation to sustain life. And so this is a great week for us to pause and to give thanks. Do we give thanks only when the times are good? Well, if you go back to the first Thanksgiving celebration, you find life was not too good. Uh, look back and reflect on the Plymouth. They were Calvinist Puritans. Um, they took a lot of the fun out of life in the way they practiced their faith, <laughs> being Calvinist Puritans that they were. But they were hardy people. It was tough going that first year. And there were a lot of people around them who were dying. And yet they paused to give thanks. Uh, and uh, it's interesting how the local American Indians helped them survive, teaching them how to grow corn uh, and and find a way to, to get through that first couple of years. Um, and so we're thankful for that as well. We're studying on Wednesdays a book called The Universal Christ. And this passage in Matthew is really talking about this understanding of Christ as being something that is universal. Right? So where do we find Christ? It's actually when we see and do things for other people. For those in need. Who are we doing it to? We're actually doing it for God, for Christ. So this idea that Christ is, is in all people. Actually, Christ is everywhere, is universal. This is actually a, a very biblical statement, but we sometimes neglect it in the church, in the teachings of the church. And Richard Rohr 
Uh, we covered some of these. For those of you who are in the Wednesday night Zoom, uh, this is going to be a little review. But it, it's so startling in, in how we easily overlook this that uh, it's good to just go back and see this idea. Um, Ephesians 1. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. And to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. That's a universal statement, isn't it? That in the fulfillment of time, there will be a unity to all things in heaven and on earth. That is a future statement of the universal nature of what Christ is doing and how Christ will bring unity to all things. Colossians 3.11 Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all, and is in all. Colossians 3.11 There is only Christ. He's everything. And he is in everything. Galatians 3.28 says a very similar thing. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. There is more. Colossians 3. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For your, you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, he will also appear with him. Put to death Therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. So that's talking about a transformation, isn't it? Uh, where we die to the false self. The uh, Cynthia Bourget calls it the ego operating system. And we take on Christ, the mind of Christ. But it has to do with this letting go of our earthly nature before we can do that. And then, um, well, there's, there's, we could go on and on. There's Hebrews chapter 1. Of course, we're more familiar with John chapter 1, where they also talk about this universal nature of Christ. Even in the Gospel of Thomas, which is not in our Bible, but has been recently discovered, and they believe the Gospel of Thomas is, is one of the oldest Gospels written. And in the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus is saying, Split open a piece of wood, and you will find me there. Lift up a stone, and there I am. This idea that Christ is in everything. Christ is the creator of everything and the sustainer of everything, and is in everything. And the goal which Christ is accomplishing is this unity of all things in heaven and on earth. So what is this? What does this perspective do for us? Well, in terms of human growth and development, there's, there's three categories that we can describe human development. Egocentric, ethnocentric, and world-centric. And ethnocentric is when you have your little group, and that group is the group you are a part of, and the other groups out there, you stay separated from. They're different from you. They may have wrong beliefs or wrong expectations, so you stick with your group. And that's ethnocentricity. And many people are in that world today. We find uh, political parties uh, no longer willing to work with one another because 
they're from the other group, right? And you stay loyal to your group. That's ethnocentric. Now what Jesus came along and did was try to teach that God's love is universal. It's world-centric. And our role is to reach that kind of love. God so loved the world. That's everyone. It doesn't say in John 3.16, God loves the Democrats. It doesn't say in John 3.16, God loves the Irish Catholics. It says God loves the whole world. And that's what we are striving to achieve. This ability to love everyone equally. As if we were all Christ. Matthew 25. You know, when, when the Apostle Paul, and the other thing that, that Paul gives us is the hope for transformation. I, I have uh, sometimes lost hope in humanity's ability to grow and change. People can be so stubborn sometimes, not, not us, I'm not talking about us, I'm talking about other people, can be so stubborn. And they refuse to change their views, even in light of all of the obvious facts that we all know are right there in front of us. And you know, how can you not change your view to fit the facts? People are stubborn. And sometimes we give up, right? And we cast judgment, and we say, those are wrong, bad people, and they're, they're going to be in big trouble. But this is, this is not the way for reconciliation. People can change. The Apostle Paul, he was a bad guy. He was one of the bad guys. He was a fundamentalist, religious fanatic who was trying to kill people. You know, that, that's something we don't appreciate these days, right? <clears throat> we have experience with that, and a lot of people hate that kind of religious matter. But look what happened. He was called Saul then. Look what happened on the road to Damascus. You remember what Jesus said to him? This was a dramatic Abraham Maslow would call this a peak experience on the road to Damascus, where Paul, his conscious awareness transcended out of his body and he encountered Christ. Remember what Jesus said there? Why do you persecute me? See, Jesus was already died and resurrected and ascended. He was out of the picture. But Jesus came to Saul and said, why do you persecute me? It is this universal nature that Christ is everything and in everything. So what we, whatever we do, whatever we do to the earth, whatever we do to one another, we do to Christ. And with that perspective, everything becomes sacred. Even, even the people, those stubborn people who refuse to look at the facts and have the wrong view. Even those people are Christ and are redeemable and are lovable. And Jesus showed us the way to do that. Everything is sacred. No matter how our perspective is on that person, or that part of the planet or everything is sacred now that we know that everything is Christ everything is created by Christ everything is sustained by Christ and one day everything will be unified in Christ so we look at things differently now um, the janitor at my last church we had two janitors. One took the evening shift and one took the day shift. And uh, the day shift janitor was there, oh my, I think he was there 40 years as the janitor. And um, if he was cleaning somewhere and he found a spider or a cricket, uh, 
he would carefully take the cricket or the spider and take it outside and let it go. Actually, the Buddhists are well known for this kind of respect for all of life. Everything is Christ. Everything in heaven and on earth is Christ and is in Christ. So this changes our perspective on things, right? We have this sacred appreciation for all things. And this is the nature of love, right? Love your enemies, Jesus is trying to tell us. Love those who persecute you. Well, this is impossible to do as long as we are living from the false ego, the, the selfish ego. Because our ego is constantly creating enemies for us to try to preserve itself. But when you die to the self, that self, and when you take on Christ, you no longer are defending yourself anymore. There's nothing to lose. You are Christ. Actually, one of the passages I wanted to read was this idea that we are Christ. 2 Peter 1.4 His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who's called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promise so that through them you may participate in the divine nature. You may participate in the divine nature. You are Christ when you shed the old false self. And when you live from that conscious awareness, you participate in the divine nature, 2 Peter 1, 4. The potential that we have in Christ is to love all things. And in Matthew 25, Jesus gives us a hint about this nature of reality. And especially during this time, you know, I keep seeing on the news about the long lines at food banks in various parts of the country. And it's interesting how often these food banks uh, are run by a pastor. And the news people usually interview the pastor to talk about the situation of that food bank and the long lines and how many people they fed, etc. And this is this is wonderful publicity good publicity for the church, and we need good publicity, <laughs> But understanding that when we give to those in need, when we help the homeless, we are doing it for Christ. And when we realize that actually the final fulfillment of all is the unity of all things in heaven on earth, when we give to those in need, we are actually helping ourselves, because we're all in this together. And actually, our progress and our future fulfillment of the kingdom of heaven coming to earth is something that we are doing together. And Richard Rohr makes this comment uh, in his book on the universal Christ. We've tended to look, the church in the West and the U.S. has tended to look as salvation as an individual thing, there's more to it than that. We're actually in this all together. Because as it says in the scripture there, ultimately the final fulfillment is the unity of all things. That we will be living together in harmony as one. So we're in this together. Even those stubborn people who refuse to see the facts that are right in front of them. So we are ministers of reconciliation. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you for sending us Jesus to show us the way and also to give us the truth and the life and life itself. May we see Christ everywhere and realize the glorious nature of 
your creation found wherever we go and wherever we are. In Christ's name, amen. to see if it would, would play. And I was in my office and I'm like, what's Bob doing here singing? He's, he, I didn't think he was doing in-person singing. But the quality was, was great uh, in that. Uh, and I hope that went through with the video at home that you could hear Bob's great voice. So thanks so much for that. Now may the love of God our Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all today and forevermore. Amen. Um.